everyone. We are Asian Others. I'm Kei Chen. I'm Ivy Chung. And we are your hosts tonight. It's our pleasure to stand here and share our thoughts with our dear guests. Tonight, our topic is humanitarian aid. You might wonder, what is humanitarian aid? First, let's take a look at some answers from well-known organizations. European Civil Protection and Humanitarian Operation defined as delivering life-saving assistance to those in need without any adverse distinction. As for the United Nations, they define it as delivering rapid, life-saving humanitarian assistance to those in need whenever and wherever disease outbreaks strike in response to natural disasters or during complex crises. So let us first divide this word into two parts. The word A in the phrase means organizations or governmental agencies providing and giving help in form of food, money, medical supplies, or weapons in order to help people escape from the poverty cycle. From our presentation, all of our groupmates will give our audience some advice to face this serious issue. Secondly, it's humanitarian. Its concept is similar to the definition which Kate mentioned previously, without any adverse distinction. The word itself means helping people who are living in terrible conditions and are suffering because of war, floods, earthquakes, and other disasters. Most importantly, the word also means preventing unfair treatment of people. It's true that we should all be respectful when we help those in need. Not only do we provide them with resources, but also give them mental support. We did some research exploring various aspects, reflecting on ourselves, and truly look forward to sharing with you all. First, we look at gender equality. The first group is going to reveal some unbearable truth and moral taboos, and finally, ways to make a change. Let's welcome Ian and Vincent. Hello, my name is Ian. And I'm Vincent. As you know from Ivy and Kate's short introduction, today we are going to share ideas on how improving gender inequality can positively affect our society. Although gender equality is well known to the majority of people, some still chose to ignore it and carry on with their own life. Gender equality means neither men nor women shouldn't be treated differently in their lives. It can be rights, authority, or payments. Today, we are going to share our guests some of the real but unbearable truths about gender inequality around the world. Take Yemen as an example. Yemen is a country in the southwestern and the southern of the Arabian Peninsula, which is known for its rich biodiversity. In 2014, the Houthi insurgents, who are enemies of the Sunni government, took over of Yemen's capital, demanding for lower fuel prices and a new government. This is mainly because of the difference of their religious beliefs. They might be Muslim, but they have a completely opposite perspective of what the Quran says. It is an eight year conflict, and also compounded with an economic collapse. The COVID pandemic and natural disasters such as floods and earthquakes took an inordinate toll on women and girls too. Their health system is corrupt, so medical problems begin to emerge. Many women died during pregnancy and due to other health issues, all because of the conflict. Unlike Taiwan and other peaceful countries, women have better treatment and health care. Another problem is that when, Afghan when the Taliban took over Afghanistan, women after 12 were forced to stay at home and study the Quran. Their motive is also because of an extreme interpretation of the Muslim religion. The Taliban uses some of the most severe laws to control the people in Afghanistan. Women are placed very low in the Islamic world. They have many taboos which are immoral. Unlike the men, they are free to protest, can join the army, and also have the right to participate in educational programs. We can see that not only conflict will create humanitarian crisis, but religion plays a crucial part too. What can we possibly do now? Although we are still junior high school students, our influence is still very strong and powerful. We can simply start from our everyday lives. We can be a volunteer and help foundations to donate a certain amount of food and money to poorer countries. People now can have a higher opportunity of having a meal. They can now live a life that everyone else does. The United Nations is also an important organization for helping out humanitarian crises. The change isn't something that can be achieved in just a month or a year. Feminism has increased thanks to the organization. 
the United Nations has set global standards against gender inequality. Some things are just right in front of our eyes, but we just don't have the time to react and realize that it is happening and worsening right now. To make the world for better and work free, it is our decision whether to join in and stand up for the victims or leave them being trapped and stuck in the loop of suffering. Keep on doing this, the world will definitely be more and more peaceful. This is Vincent. And I, Ian. We bid our teachers, guests, parents a lovely night. Thanks to Ian and Vincent, it's true that both stopping and challenging gender stereotypes will make some differences. Next, the second group is going to talk about human trafficking, how underground surgeries are performed, how child labor happened, and most importantly, how can we solve this issue starting from protecting ourselves? Let's welcome Giants and George. Hello, I'm Giant Lee. And I'm George Lee. Back in the 18th century, slavery was firmly entrenched into society around the world. During the 1830s and 1840s, more than 250,000 people were enslaved and taken across continents. The slave market was one of the most evil economic systems across all countries. The market developed its own twisted, evil culture, languages, and ways to live alone with legal markets. Sadly, hundreds of years later, today, these problems remain and are still happening actively. Victims are cheated and taken to less developed countries, never seen again. So, what makes trafficking so active, and how can we protect ourselves? You probably have heard about transplants. You donate your organs or tissues to others that are facing organ failures. Doctors transplant the organs into their bodies, and they function as usual. In normal cases, Patients have to wait for donors to get their organs. This process may take months or even years. So wealthier people may turn to illegal organ providers to get their organs as soon as possible. But where do the organs come from? Yes, kidnapping. People are cheated and taken to a distant country. Underground surgery is done, and they are released to a foreign place. The lucky ones can make their way back home while others are never seen again. Um, we all know that most of the chocolate and coffee beans come from African country. Tropical climax bring out tropical agriculture industry, which is now the main income for Africa. Uh, however, the price is much set by the connoisseurs and distributors, who we'll always find it at a low price. During money, the smallholder farmers must lower the costs and child workers are seen by these evil businessmen as the best solution. Teenagers and children are paid pittance. They don't have enough strength to fight against the virus, let alone escape from them. There are numerous organizations that are trying to resolve the problem of human trafficking. The International Justice Mission is one of them. They collaborate with local governors and community leaders to fight effectively against all kinds of all kinds of violence. They also provide lessons and resources to the locals for rescuing victims, deterring criminals from wor worsening their crimes, and they have dramatically decreased the number of trafficking of humans. The Exodus Road is an expert in interpreting to liberate individuals who are currently a victim of human trafficking. They train local agents to identify victims and uh, gather evidence to so, uh, gather evidence and gather evidence and support free the victims. Uh, organization and governments have been dealing with human trafficking issues for a long period of time, but due to a complex culture of the crime, the problems on their surface are surface are hard to be solved completely. What we could do is to protect ourselves, making sure that someone knows where you are can decrease the chance of being kidnapped. Always be alert no matter where you are. If you think there's a threat, leave a place at once. Also, kidnappers trap victims down and wait for a moment that they're most vulnerable to an attack. 
So never leave yourself alone in a dangerous place. In conclusion, remember three things. Stay clever, stay alert, stay safe. Thank you. George for talking about this serious issue constantly occurring around the globe. It's true that we should all put in some effort to make sure that everyone is safe. Next, the third group is going to talk about the refugee crisis. I believe through their presentation, all of you will have a deeper insight into this problem. Let's welcome Belle and Amber. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Amber Su and I'm Belle Shen. Do you know how many people have lost the protection of their country of origin? According to UNHCR statistics, there are about 26 million international refugees in the world. And they mainly come from five countries. Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Myanmar. However, due to the recent impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, more and more Ukrainians have become refugees. Since the start of the war in February 2022, about 5.13 million Ukrainians have been registered as refugees. A refugee is defined as a person who is persecuted on the grounds of race, religion, or nationality in a particular social group or political opinion, and who is unable to or doesn't want to accept the protection of one's own country. Or, ethnic, tribal, or religious violence are often the main reasons the refugee flee their homes. Speaking of wars, a well-known one is the Syrian civil war since 2011, which refers to the armed conflict between supporters of the Syrian president and the Syrian revolutionary opposition. Syrian civil war refugees are those Syrians who fled abroad as refugees after the civil war broke out in Syria in 2011. As of 2015, 4 million Syrians had fled abroad, and another 7.6 million are internally displaced. Most refugees who fled abroad stayed in Syria's neighbors, Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. So, how can we help these people? First, we can donate to reliable organizations. There are many civil or international organizations on the list. Donating money to keep them running is a good way to help the refugees. Take UNHCR as an example. By making a monthly donation to the organization, you can provide refugees with ongoing relief and protection to help them regain hope for a better life. We can also support refugee relief services in various countries. Over five years of civil war, millions of Syrians have fled their homes and gone to Europe and the United States to find shelter. They have endured untold hardships, but countries are also struggling to cope. If your country happens to have refugee camps or related facilities, you can do your best to provide love so that these war-torn souls can feel the warmth of home. Some organizations are dedicated to helping the refugees. For instance, Doctors Without Borders was founded in 1971 by a group of doctors with journalists after Nigeria's civil war. These doctors go deep into war-torn areas and their lives are often threatened. They provide professional medical care to people in need for free. Regardless of race, nationality, or religious background, volunteers assist the wounded in wars or natural disasters to be killed. Another example is Refuge Point, which was founded in 2005, using private funding to identify refugees stranded by humanitarian aid. They have developed a unique full-service response model to assist urban refugees and promote their self-reliance. It's time for us to face the refugee problem. There are about 26 million international refugees in the world. These migrants may have been detained, enslaved, or even violently persecuted, not getting the right to education and work. To sum up, we can donate our money to reliable organizations and protect the refugees. Another way to help them is to support refugee relief services in your country and let them fill the words of hope. This is the end of our presentation. Thank you for your interest. why tragedies like the refugee crisis are happening. Next, the fourth group is going to talk about child labor. 
they are going to introduce some vital problems, including child abusing, children's emotional and physical well-being, and lastly, ways to improve child welfare. Let's welcome Sophie and Berlin. Sophie Wong and I'm Rolling Zhe. It is a pleasure to be here to share our ideas with you. Tonight we're going to talk about child welfare. Have you ever heard that there are many children who can't have a stable life? Of course, the Russia-Ukraine war has been ongoing for over a year and the safety, health and education of many children have been affected. The war causes children injuries, hunger and separation from their families. It violates the spirit of the Convention on the Rights of Child. This convention ensures that every child can enjoy basic child welfare. And child welfare needs to protect children in special difficult situations, such as those who live in a disadvantaged family or have been abused. Let's learn some issues about child welfare and how to improve the life of these children. There are many issues in child welfare. First, I'm going to talk about child abuse and neglect. But physical abuse are shocking due to marked abuse. Not all signs of child abuse are obvious. Ignoring children's needs, putting them in a dangerous situation, or making them feel worse are also kind of abuse and neglect, and they can leave deep, lasting scars on them. Additionally, children's health and emotional well-being are also really important. It may cause trauma, anxiety, and even depression if they have been exposed to abuse or violence. Violence. We must preserve their safety in all aspects, or the children will never feel safe and lead an abnormal life. In response to child welfare issues, many child welfare agencies have some been set up, but maintaining high quality assistance at all times remains a challenge. The main reason is that the child welfare agencies of a space resources conscious, such as limited funding, staff lives, and high caseload. And this is especially true in the rural areas. Next, let's learn more about trauma. Trauma-informed care is necessary because it can help children soothe their emotions. Unfortunately, many child welfare agencies have problems employing specially trained staff and implementing trauma-informed practices. What can we do to help solve these challenges? An effective method is to identify and address issues before they escalate and lead to more significant problems. Also, preventive services like parenting, education, and other services can help reduce any kinds of harm. Furthermore, we have to distribute the resources fairly. Because children who lack child welfare may often be discriminated against or be left at by others. Every child should receive the same resources, not due to factors such as race or family background, resulting in unfair services. In conclusion, child welfare is a critical issue that requires ongoing attention to ensure the well-being and protection of the vulnerable children. By solving key issues, challenges, and implementing strategies, we can all contribute to improve child welfare. It requires an enormous effort including government, communities, child welfare agencies, and even you and me. Let us take action and try our best to change the world. This is the end of our presentation. Thank you for listening. Thanks to Sophie and Rowling. It's true that we have to take immediate action and contribute into improving child welfare. Next, a fifth year is going to talk about hunger and malnutrition. What leads to this problem, organizations that help, and finally, how can we get involved into this project? Let's welcome Tiffany and Melody. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tiffany. And I'm Melody. Today, we are going to share some ideas with you about how we can make a difference to solve the issues of hunger and malnutrition. Hey, do you know that about 3 million children under the age of 5 die from hunger-related causes each year? 
Yeah, I've seen a lot of news about the famine problem around the world. I remember that I once saw a startling photo. In the photo, a skinny little girl squatted on the ground with her head down, and she was so bony that I could clearly see her bones. She was struggling with life and death. Just right behind her was a vulture. Pictures like this are happening every moment in many countries with hunger and malnutrition issues around the world. After sadly declining for a decade, world hunger is on the rise, affecting nearly 10% of people globally. From 2019 to 2022, the number of undernourished people grew by as many as 150 million. The climate crisis is also one of the leading causes of the steep rise in global hunger. Climate shocks destroy lives, crops, and what we food and undermines people's ability to feed themselves. Gravely, there are many organizations helping. We are going to tell you about two of them who fight for zero hunger. First of all, a non-governmental organization called AAS shows for action against hunger. For action against hunger is a central concept. They have saved more than 45 countries and 25 million people. Malnutrition is not only the greatest threat to child survival worldwide, but also the underlying cause of half of all children's death. The workers in NFL try to raise awareness of hygiene and the importance of infant health care practices to education. Also, AF teaches parents to detect malnutrition at home with their help. This way, the team can monitor the children's nutrition status regularly. Second, World Hunger Health is one of the biggest private organizations in Germany for development and humanitarian aid. Zero Hunger by 2030 is a clear goal for the organization for reference to sustainable development goals. World Hunger House's basic concept is that everyone in this world is equal and valued, so each and every person should have the rights to control their lives. WHH is focusing on improving the food and nutrition situation. Sustainable development goals include two points which are zero hunger and no poverty. Now, let's see what we can do to help with the hunger and malnutrition crisis. Actually, we can do many meaningful things to help solve hunger. We can get involved in a 30-hour famine event, donate money to organizations, volunteer to help, and send gifts like food and livestock. Do any of these helping actions encourage you? Hunger is predictable preventable and treatable. Think of those poor children in another corner of the earth. They are starving, even dying every second. In order to help them, we can make contributions by our own power in our daily lives. We can and should do something meaningful to help because our small acts of kindness can make life or death to them. We have the ability to help together for a world without hunger. Thank you very much for listening. And we hope you all enjoy our sharing about the hunger and malnutrition issue. Thanks to Tiffany and Melody with their topic on hunger and malnutrition. Surely there are many things we can do in order to break the cycle of conflict and hunger. Next, the sixth group is going to talk about access to health care. From their presentation, we can learn more about this thing that we always take for granted. Let's welcome Johnny and Albert. Hello everyone, my name is Johnny. And my name is Albert. It's that Patrick could be here tonight. Tonight, we would like to introduce the issue, Access to Healthcare with you. Healthcare seems like it's for granted in our lives, but places that suffer disasters can't usually access healthcare. There are multiple reasons that vulnerable populations can't access healthcare. So, what is access to healthcare? The main definition is the ability for people to receive appropriate healthcare resources, which can preserve or improve their health. But there are many issues that might threaten access to healthcare. First, let's talk about insurance. People often need insurance to make sure they can get appropriate health care. But many people live without any kind of insurance because there aren't affordable rates. 
As a result, the U.S. government has implemented policies and extended insurance to cover the cost of health care. People lacking of health care literacy is also not a big problem. People facing poverty might misunderstand the importance of preventive care, which can make them suffer from great danger. So to solve these problems, it is important to implement health education, also to adjust the literacy level timely, for instance, providing visual aid to patients. The next issue is discrimination. If a patient receives discrimination, they might feel not respected and refuse to return a visit next time, which leads to missing important healing process. First of all, religious influences can be an obstacle against access to health care. Some cultural factors are prejudiced against using Western medical techniques. Good education cannot religious communities understand the necessity of modern medical techniques. Another reason is racism. Racism makes policies that can limit the service people of different races get. In this situation, we suggest increase the diversity of some members in medical office. In this way, we sure can increase patients from different races to seek medical service. The next problem is a shortage of healthcare staffing. According to related statistics, in less than 10 years, there will be up to 124,000 doctors short. What a huge number! In addition, one third of the lack will be in primary medicine. The short includes other staff in hospital, such as nurses and technologists. So, we can expect technology uptake from telehealth to patient engagement to train more staff in hospitals and increase the capacity of providers. That way, we can address the gap. Last but not least, war is always the biggest reason people can't access to healthcare. First, the resources of the medical program might be stopped, which makes the progress forced to stop. Also, children in emergency situations have high risks of suffering malnutrition. In addition, places with an epidemic sure need vaccines for prevention practice. As a result, the government should provide telehealth service to make sure health care can reach remote areas. Furthermore, UNICEF provides nutritional food stuff to make sure children get rid of illness. Moreover, UNICEF's immunization contribution is a must mention. They make sure all places under epidemic can get those life-saving vaccines. So, if actually giving aid to the people suffering is not the one you can reach, we at least should not criticize them. So, as, as to make their humanitarian program even harder to implement. Trust me, you, you can, can change, change the world. world. This is the end of our presentation. We hope you enjoyed a lot. We appreciate your full attention and we wish you all a pleasant night. Thank you, and we wish you all a good night.